So, this would be our first US Open live stream, I believe, because time zones have never worked. And actually, I don't know if this is going to work as a live stream because I've never done one at this time of day before. I don't know how many of you will be here live, but if you are here, bring your questions and we can look back at the first round of the 2019 US Open, which is already over. And the second round starts very shortly, so lots to discuss, but I need your help with that because I need your questions to answer. I did say we'd take a closer look at the draw in this video because um, I didn't have much to say about it in the video that I filmed at the beginning of the week, which was essentially my predictions for who could win the tournament. If you didn't catch that video, still relevant, so go check it out after. And yeah, let's get started talking about US Open round one. Going to try and, oh, I say this all the time, going to try and keep it more concise, but when does that ever happen? So we'll see how we go. Um, first day, we've had two days of action, so the first round spans over two days. First day already feels like ages ago. Uh, we saw big names moving through, Serena Williams emphatically, Novak Djokovic, Roger Federer had to think for a moment then who was on which side of the draw. Ashley Barty, the number two seed, threw in three sets. So the only real um, big name upset on the first day would have been Angelique Kerber to Kristina Mladenovic. But Kerber lost early at Wimbledon and Mladenovic is a very tough first round. She's not seeded because she's had an iffy year and an iffy past couple of years to say the least. But her quality of tennis is top five standard, in my opinion, with the way she can mix it up. And when she's feeling confident as well, that was a really horrible draw for Kerber. So I wasn't surprised to see her crashing out. All in all, for the first round of a slam, on the first day, the seeds didn't do too badly. I mean, we're used to seeing all of them crashing out in um, massive groups, but that didn't really happen on the first day. However, it was a bit of a deja vu on the second day of first round action when we saw both Stefano Tsitsipas and Dominic Team crashing out round one, a repeat of their showings at Wimbledon. And funnily enough, Thomas Fabiano, who took Tsitsipas out of Wimbledon, was there to take out Team. For that reason alone, I kind of almost saw that one coming. On the one hand, I did think that Team with the way he stepped up, particularly during the clay court season, was a top contender outside of the big three. But Thomas Fabiano and fast American hard courts, with the confidence he has having beaten Tsitsipas, a similar kind of player, in the first round of Wimbledon, same as with Kerber and Mladenovic, that was a tough draw, a deceptively tough, tough draw for team. And he went out in four sets and honestly wasn't overly surprised. Were you surprised by that one? Let me know. Um... So that they were the two, I guess, big shots and shocks in terms of seeded players yesterday. But, you know, Wimbledon kind of gave us a bit of prep for that. Zverev squeezed through in five, of course. Um, a few see more seeds did go out. Gobini Muguruza. I actually, um, do I admit this? Yes, I do, because we're live and I've just kind of indicated. I had Muguruza down as kind of an outside contender to win this event and I, I must put out there right now that this is only because at the beginning of the year I did think or did say that I thought Muguruza would win a slam this year for no other reason than the fact that she had such a terrible season last year by her standards and I thought well for someone as talented as her the only way is up and generally at these grand slams for the women you don't you can't really tell who the eventual champion will be by their pre-tournament form and Muguruza kind of ticked the boxes for that. Uh, nope, out to Alison Risk and that was a, I tell you what, you know, there's good depth in both fields at the moment, which means there are a lot of tricky openers for the seeded players. But all in all, you know, no massive shocks, I would say. Let me know if you disagree, but I think, you know, for the Grand Slams we've had in recent times, nothing really made me take a double glance, you know, during this first round. I think, all in all, it's been not too surprising and it keeps the tournament looking very interesting. Right, we've got some questions coming in. Someone comments the match between Coco Gauff and Anastasia Potapova was amazing. Didn't watch that one, actually. Uh, two 
well, Posipova's kind of moved out of juniors now. Goff looking to do the same, but almost kind of a junior match there on a Grand Slam stage. It was a massive opportunity for both. Both of them had the home pressure. So I think a similar situation for both players in that match, obviously. You, you, do you know what? A lot of people, I think, would expect Goff to have more pressure in that match. Uh, but actually, Potapova's going to see that match as an opportunity and probably feel the support for Goff as well, which is going to make it a tough match for her too. I'm not surprised it went to three sets. I, I think there were probably some nerves and tension early in the match, even though I didn't watch it, but I, I looked back at the stats and stuff afterwards. Um, yeah, I think with the level both of those two are at, I'm guessing it wasn't the highest quality match, but given that, you know, these are two girls that probably know each other very well, and given everything that was on the line in that match, I'm not surprised that it was a close contest, and like Goff's match against Herzog at Wimbledon, not quality, but as far as the drama and battle goes, very entertaining. So that's that one. Um... What do you think about Zvetlana Kuznetsova losing to Christy Arn yesterday? We could go in Cincinnati, she was very good. Well, if you've watched the last video of mine on this channel, you'll know that I wouldn't know if she was very good or not in Cincinnati, because I missed the whole of that tournament and the tournament before. Um, only saw, I mean, I mean, I know who won, obviously, but I didn't see any of the tennis. The thing with Kuznetsova is that she won her slams a long time ago. She's obviously still talented, but she's getting towards the back end of her career. And honestly, there are just better players out there. I think the game is moving on from her style. She very much reminds me of a Samantha Stoza kind of player. Um, heavy shots, heavy topspin, but not consistent enough to do repeated damage and might have a good week or two here and there. But losing to an American, you know, Christiane, home player, uh, will have the backing of the crowd. And if you utilize that, that can be a very big weapon in itself. So as far as that result goes, just not surprised, really. And Kuznetsova, you know, might still have a couple of good runs left in her, but I think the glory days are in the past and this is where she now goes and wins the Australian Open. But um, they're my thoughts really on Kuznetsova. Um, but yeah, th there have been some good matches so far, some five setters already, um, na usual names kind of grinding through, such as Alexander Zverev. Now, what are the feelings as far as Zverev and these five setters go? Obviously, people are expecting Zverev to kind of break through this at some point, come through Winner Slam. I mean, he has all the talent, all the potential to win a slam. He's won the ATP finals. He's beaten the big three. He the, This is the next step, right, for him to break through and win a slam. But for me, with Zverev and these best of five matches, I think the more he's taken to best of five sets, and I've particularly felt this during the last two majors, the more he's going out there with the mentality that he's going to go five. So even if he's playing well, like he was against, I think he was two sets to live up on John Millman at the French Open in the first round. And speaking of John Millman, poor, poor guy. So many injuries and the tough draws he's getting at majors. I really feel for him. But no, Zverev was up, I think, two sets to love on Millman playing really well, really confidently. Suddenly you think, oh, He's gonna he's gonna make it through in straight sets. Uh, nope, uh, because he's in this mental headspace now, where I guess one or two points is all it takes to change the tide in a tennis match. And Zverev is thinking, you know, of all these times that he's gone to five, he can't help but like he can't ignore it because everyone's talking about it. So I think you know, tennis is so mental, and I talk about this all the time. Um, Anna Smith, who I did my radio show with on Love Sport Radio, who's a player, I said that it was like 50% mental. She said she'd say it was 80% mental, really, the game of tennis and all these thoughts that are going through your mind at the speed of light during a match. And I think for Zverev coming through that five setter, it was against Radu Albot, who's really stepped it up this year, to be fair. He's got um, a nice game to watch, pretty fluid. But, you know, that is a match that Zverev should be winning more straightforwardly. And in previous slams, I've been saying of Zverev, oh, it's good that he's coming through these five setters because it shows endurance, because it's a boost of confidence that even though he's taken the distance, he is able to come through. 
actually what I'm thinking now is the more it goes to five the less helpful it is and it doesn't really indicate much for the future it just shows that he's going out there expecting to be taken the distance so yeah it's um it's difficult to kind of predict anything for the future as far as Zverev's current matches at Grand Slams go um but let me know guys if any of you were shocked surprised by the upsets of Sitsipas and team because them being in the top 10 and them being some of the biggest threats to the big three in terms of players that could upset them outside of slams anyway I guess there should be more expectation on these two players to go the distance at slams but I mean as I've said before it is this best of five set thing where it's just more difficult to sustain level to have the endurance and with Sitsipas I mean, he was cramping. He It was a dramatic, dramatic match against Andrei Rublev. He, alongside team, got a difficult opening round. Rublev beat Federer the other week, and he's building on that, playing with confidence, and was, from what I saw, keeping Sitsipas quite far behind the baseline. Now, we know that Sitsipas is a player who likes to move forward, who um, is coming to the net a lot. He's kind of one of the, the big-name old-school players on tour at the moment. And Rublev was holding him back. Rublev wasn't letting him uh, come forward. And, you know, to, um, Sitsipas was standing right back to try and try and get some time on the ball at times, but it wasn't working. And the, the courts are playing really fast. So with Sitsipas struggling with cramp as well, there's not much time to catch your breath. There's not much time to regroup. It was just a, kind of a nightmare scenario for him in the backstages of that match. So a combination of things really for Sitsipas. Tricky draw, tricky conditions, physical conditions for him. Um, obviously there was some drama where he kind of lost his temper a bit with the umpire. I'm not condoning that, but I'm also not surprised by it either. Um, difficult match for both players, but you know, team as well, I think, was feeling the lack of time on the ball against Fabiano, who was really ripping his ground strokes and looking for ways to come to the net. Uh, um, at times on the return, team was pretty much stood with his back against the wall, just trying to trying to find his placement, you know, and trying to get himself into the rallies, but um was really just pushed back and I think it was a theme really in both the matches with Sitsipas and team but I also felt that the third set tie break in the Sitsipas forgetting who they all played now Sitsipas Rublev match was um very instrumental when it came to deciding who would actually win the match and Sitsipas had that on his racket at one point um, I did think that he he was stepping up, he was taking the ball early, ripping the forehands deep, and if he'd maintained that, then he would have had the third set in the bag, and even though he was cramping, you know, it, it's amazing how close he kept the match when he was struggling physically, and I think he would really have had his chances, but tennis, you know, slim margins, and... It's impressive at the moment, the depth on the ATP, the ATP I feel with the all the contenders on the women's side has come in for some stick with people saying that they don't have the same depth they don't have the same challenges what people overlook here is that when it comes to grand slams to majors they're not playing best of three they're playing best of five sets and i'll say it over and over again that makes the difference because if grand slams were best of three set matches who have we seen win the ATP finals over the past few years? Alexander Zverev, Grigor Dimitrov. They're going to find the majors a lot easier to win. And I think when you look at big upsets at slams, when you look at upsets outside of slams, you know, the depth is there on the ATP. They just have five sets to contend with over seven matches in a major. So I think any criticism that comes for the ATP saying that there's a lack of depth, um, you know, Maybe there's a bit of a lack of consistency, but the depth is 100% there. I can see a lot of questions coming in, so I'll, I'll kind of catch up on um, what people are saying. Um, yeah, Sitsipas lost to Rublev. Did I say otherwise? I can't remember. Um, Rublev is a very good player, solid, massive backhand. Was the first next-gen next gen player to make a quarter-final at a Grand Slam. Oh, nice stat there. Didn't know that. Um, in New York in 2017. Injury pulled him back for a while. Now, here's the thing, because Rublev was really 
up there on the scene a few years ago. But injury hits and people are kind of forgotten about because there's always a new story. Every Grand Slam, there's your next breakout star. And um, I mean, he's into his 20s now, but Tanasi Kokonakis is another one of these. He just got his first Grand Slam win in four years because not because he's not talented but because injuries have been persistently holding him back and it's easy to forget that you know there is talent out there that's just been held back because of things that are out of that player's control um what do you think about your Stremska versus Pettersson match Diana Stremska versus Rebecca Pettersson I know Pettersson came past Monica Puig I think in round one uh who will win um, it's an interesting match to draw out. You know, Yastremska had a real opportunity at Wimbledon to take um, take advantage of an open draw, and she kind of flinched in the headlights, I guess. Uh, Pettersson, I've commentated on. I, I've commentated on both these two players actually this year. Uh, Yastremska, you can see why people are excited about her. She can get good firepower on the ball and. Um, reads the reads the game well. She's very confident. There's a reason she's won titles. Uh, Pettersson is. I I don't see her having the same. And Yastrzemska, I would say, um, but at this point in time, you know, it could go either way. Yastrzemska's not got the consistency yet, and Pettersson has big name wins. So there's potential there. I can see my stream is buffering and I forgot that my Wi-Fi is absolutely terrible at the moment. So let me know if you can still see and hear me. Uh, I'm gonna refresh this and see if it works. Give me a moment. Looks like we're still going. Um, now an advert's gonna play, so I'm, I'm out of position. But yeah, so you Stremska versus Pettersson is one of those ones that I think, you know, is a great opportunity for both in a Grand Slam second round and could really go either way. Uh, yes, we're still going. Hallelujah. Thank you very much for letting me know you can see me. Um, where are we at then? I've got to find my place again. I'm literally just sat here in fear that the Wi-Fi might drop at any moment. It's absolutely terrible at the moment, probably because so many people are trying to use it. Um, okay. Where are we at? Do, do, do. Yeah, someone says, I'm really not surprised Sitsipis and team lost. Uh, you and me both. So we've, um, okay. Everybody thought that Venus Williams versus Alina Zvitalina will be on Arthur Ashe Arena, not Karolina Pliskova. Um, yeah, that's a fair comment, but was Venus on Arthur Ashe in her first round match? Because sometimes it's to do with who's been where already. Um, I, let's have a look. So it was day one that Venus played and beat, let me get this right, Zheng Sai Sai, six love, six one, I think it was. Um, uh, let's find it. Well, uh, straight off, I can see that it wasn't on Arthur Ashe. It was actually on Louis Armstrong, which is the second biggest court. Yes, yeah, six one, six love for Venus. That's a strange one. Um, I've stopped commenting on scheduling as much because it is what it is. You know, organizers have their agenda, their way of working things, and not everyone's going to be happy. But considering that Venus is an American, that she's won this event before, that she's a seven time Grand Slam champion, and that Elena Zvitolina is one of the top seeds, it is weird that that match isn't on. Arthur Ashe because I mean Plushkova's the strong favourite in that other match so yeah weird one and at this point I kind of just don't know what's going through the heads of slam organisers so that one's on them um I was quite shocked that every I'm reading someone else's comment here by the way I was quite shocked that every seed in the top 10 in Nadal's half lost Nadal said that team was sick and he was surprised that Hashinov and Bautista are good lost yeah there was some things going round about team not quite feeling himself so it's a person team both really um you know he, he had a tough draw and if things aren't 100 percent physically great then stuff can happen um i it's interesting you know because we are seeing a bit of a wimbledon deja vu here because um at wimbledon uh i think definite two of Sitsipas team and zverev if not all three of them 
uh, were in Novak Djokovic's half. Djokovic already had the easier half at Wimbledon compared to the Federer Nadal half, and um, all of them lost early. So Djokovic's half then became even more of an, I don't want to say easy because no match at a slam is easy, but more of a straightforward route. And we're seeing exactly the same thing happen with Nadal here. Obviously, Nadal had the um, more open half of the draw at the beginning of this one, and two of his biggest contenders, Team and Tsitsipas, out round one. We're seeing Wimbledon repeat itself. It's, it's quite interesting. Um, but uh, how many watched the Nadal match? Because I, I had it on. At this point in Islam, I've got multiple matches on at once, so I, I'm not really in-depth on any one match apart from... Serena versus Sharapova, just to confirm my suspicions on how that one was going to play out, went the way I expected. But um, with the Nadal match against Millman, um, two really gritty players there, real fighters. Uh, Nadal with the more intense weapons. Felt for Millman because obviously he beat Federer here last year, I believe made the quarterfinals, so that's a lot of ranking points lost for him. Difficult draw. Uh, but I felt like... A lot more was decided, at least for the first two sets, by unforced errors during that match. And I guess with long, grueling rallies, that's often going to be the case. But, you know, Nadal's game plan was still there that he's been showing this year, being more aggressive, looking to finish the points uh, with winners and coming forward. But a bit of an erratic start for him. So, I mean, still great for him that he could do it in straight sets and has a very opportune draw here. So I'd be surprised not to see him going deep, but um, yeah, I was a, a little bit surprised at the the number of unforced errors from Nadal early in this one. Um, yeah, Karen Hashinov, I, do you know what? I was probably more surprised by Hashinov lo losing than Team and Tsitsipas, just because I saw him as a bit of a dark horse. He did so well at the French Open this year. Um, was transferring his form to grass a bit. You know, he, he's he got a big hitting game that actually plays well on any surface. Uh, great forehand, great serve. And when I was going in my previous video, again, when I was looking at players that could challenge outside of the big three, Hashinov's name did cross my mind. So, yeah, I'm quite a bit surprised to see who... I can't remember. I was keeping track of the score last night. I think he lost in five, but who is it to? Um, Karen Hashinov. I'll know this the moment I see it. Who did he lose to? It was Basil. There we go. Pospisil. It's been a while since I've seen Pospisil's name doing stuff. I think he's had his fair share of injuries as well. And yeah, again, you know, Pospisil not always physically fit, but he's, you know, he's beaten Andy Murray before. He's had done damage at slams. He's gone deep. Uh, I think he made the Wimbledon quarters one year. So he's a player that knows about these big stages. And Bautista Agut, you know, was at the beginning of the year one of the most consistent ATP players. Um, has really stepped it up, beaten Djokovic twice this year. And both times he was on the brink of losing in straight sets. That takes real mental strength to come through that kind of match. So, yeah, I think I can say that Hashinov and Bautista Agut going out is more surprising, probably, than Team and Tsitsipas. From my perspective, I don't know if someone else would differ, but yeah, I think, you know, there were opportunities there for both of them. And but again, you know, the US Open last slam of the year, uh, mental fatigue, physical fatigue setting in. I think this does has an Im have an impact. And Hashtanov and Bautista Regret are two players that have risen up this year, probably more so in, than in previous years. So it's not something they're necessarily used to. So that's an interesting one. Um, thoughts on a possible Stan Wawrinka versus Novak Djokovic match that could get interesting uh, Djokovic is still up there for me as one of obviously one of the dominant ones one of the lead contenders to win here if not the lead contender to win but the US Open is where things can go awry just because of the length of the season so far for the likes of Djokovic Federer and Nadal and Wawrinka you know, came through his first round match in four sets I believe um, over, it was Yannick Sinner, wasn't it, that he played the 18-year-old, oh, 19-year-old teenager, anyway, wasting time on this. And yeah, for Vavrinka, you know, former champion here, and when Vavrinka's won slams, even though he's obviously very talented, a uh, consistent contender and threat to the big three and Andy Murray and the like, 
he isn't always on the radar so much prior to winning a slam. So I think it would be at your peril to overlook Vavrinka. Obviously, he's beaten Djokovic at a slam before. So the thought of facing Djokovic isn't going to be daunting to him. Therefore, I think that one could be interesting. So Vavrinka, yeah, is in the Djokovic and Federer half. It's um, pretty stacked now compared to Nadal's half, not going to lie. So, yeah, I think the, the most intriguing matches are probably going to come in that section of the draw at the moment. Um, yeah, Zverev's still in. Zverev didn't lose, but um, scraped his way through. And what I was saying, Ori, Zverev is that I just can't read really into his matches anymore. I don't know if winning in five is a confidence boost for him or just a, a mental thing where he thinks he's going to keep ending up in that position. Um yeah, no, not every top no, not every top ten seed is out. That's true because Zverev came through. Um, where are we at? I've lost my place. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Um, oh, fantastic! Do you think Grigor Dimitrov will get eliminated today? Well, let's see who is playing because <laughs> not really on top of that. Who's Dimitrov against? Um, ah. Borna Chorich, what a match. How did I miss that one? Yeah, that that could be a good match, actually. These two were kind of at the same time, even though Dimitrov's a bit older, they were on the everyone's radar at the same time to kind of come through and be the next big things. Um, Dimitrov could well lose that match. Uh, Chorich is kind of really rising quite impressively one moment and then um, falling the next. But at the same time, I think that he's kind of more on a steady path than Chorich, uh, sorry, than Dimitrov. I think I think Dimitrov is uh, more shaky, more inclined to be streaky, obviously, than Chorich. Um, I mean, it is one that could go either way because if Dimitrov plays well, you know, it's pretty 50-50. But yeah, um, the question was, do you think Dimitrov could go out today? And I think, yeah, yeah, he could definitely lose that match. Um... Where are we at? Who's the best player under the age of 25 in the men's game? Um, I, I, you can't, when we say the best, what are we talking about? Are we talking about sheer talent? Are we talking about consistency? Because Nick Kyrgios has sheer talent, but he doesn't have consistency. So that is a very difficult question to answer because it's very subjective. It depends on what angle you're looking at it from. All I know is that there are a lot of very talented players full of potential below the age of 25, I think the future looks bright and I'm not concerned, I'm not as concerned as everyone else that these players are not yet breaking through at slams because I do think it's, you know, a physical and mental thing. They've got to develop. It's way more physical in the men's game than the women's. It's harder to break through. So yeah, that's a, that's a tough question to answer because it is very subjective. Um, Medvedev. Daniel Medvedev had great form ahead of this event. And the thing for him is, can he transfer that to best of five? Because he's shown that he has the confidence to take on anyone to beat the best. But can he do it over best of five? That's the big question. And, you know, he's still quite young, so I'm shaky on that. Uh, but if he's going to break through, you know, this is the slam to do it. This is the more open slam, the slam with opportunities. Um... I would like your thoughts on the Federer Nagal match, especially in that first set. Yeah, uh, Federer versus Summit Nagal, who I'd never seen in my life. Uh, the first set is interesting because it was, um, I mean, deja vu Wimbledon again, Federer losing the first set to a vastly unexperienced, inexperienced, virtually unknown um, qualifier. Was Lloyd Harris a qualifier at Wimbledon? I can't quite remember, but st a very similar situation. Um, two players that like to attack as well and Nogal I was very impressed with at first he was just um, wasn't leaving room for emotion or nerves any of that kind of thing he was just using the pace of the court uh, ripping off forehand and backhands and Federer just couldn't control in the in the long rallies now yeah I, th I thought it was interesting to see Federer struggling with the faster pace because obviously You'd think that's something that Federer would enjoy. You know, he, he's got a very slick, quick game and that thrives on a fast surface. But if you're not in position, it can't thrive, I guess. And Federer just looks a bit rusty. It's not the first time he's had some troubles early on at the US Open. He scrapped past 
Francis Tiafo in a pretty ugly match uh, a couple years ago. I think it was the first round 2017. Um, so it's not unusual to see Federer struggling early on. Um, in his first round matches last year, even though I think he won straight sets, four sets, I was quite unconvinced by him um, just because of, you know, the the random shank, the the unforced errors, and then obviously he went out to John Millman. So it's been a long, very successful season for Federer. No, he's not won a slam, but apart from that fourth round exit at the Australian Open, he's been really consistent right across the board. I've been impressed. Obviously a heartbreaking loss in the Wimbledon final. Um, this is his first slam match since then. I don't know what kind of impact that might have had. But what I will say is even though Federer lost the first set in disappointing fashion, I um, I said that he'd win the next set 6-1 uh, because there's just the way... There, there's always a moment for these younger guys who's not been at this stage before who are playing out of their skin where their opponent will play one or two good points or sneak out a break and suddenly they'll wake up to the situation that they're in. Um, I think that Nagal, I think he double faulted the break um, over the break at the beginning of that set and Federer was away from there. Um, I, even though he struggled a bit back end of the fourth set to close it out, I didn't see him losing the match from there just because it is so much a mental thing. And um, Federer didn't panic after losing that first set. A lot of his fans probably did, but um, he had that under control. And yeah, it's interesting um, because, like I say, Federer's been iffy at the beginning of the US Open previously, and it's been a while since he won it. So I'm not sure what this indicates. It's good that he could come through the way he did after dropping that first set, but obviously probably a little concerning that he didn't take to, to the faster atmosphere so well at the beginning. Maybe that took him by surprise. Um, Alex de Menor versus Christian Garin will be an interesting interesting match also. Borna Choric versus Grigor Dimitrov. I agree with you there. Um, Garin and de Menor, very talented younger players and in form at the moment as well. So they should be good. Um, Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much. Someone posted uh, questions elsewhere and I should have checked that before, but I'm scatty at the moment. So I so I forgot to check. Thank you very much. Checking these questions now. Amazing. OK. Um, wow, these are long questions. OK. Sitsipas has a horrible record against Medvedev, Felix Alger, Aliasim and almost everyone who knows him from the junior circuit. All of them understand he doesn't get into position quickly enough to take the ball on his backhand and has been getting jammed on his backhand on a slightly faster court. Now the entire tour is figuring him out slowly and steadily, jamming him on his backhand. He has absolutely no return game, okay, as people jam serves on his backhand. Best example was against Jan Leonard Struff. Now, well, before we go any further, Jan Leonard, Jan Leonard Struff has had a great season. I've been following him. Um, love the serve and volley, the, the heaviness of the ball, the intensity. Um, re relies heavily on the tiebreakers to win a great percentage of his matches. Yes, Sitsipas does go to a lot of tiebreaks, you know, um, and it's an interesting point on the backhand because the one-handed backhand when it's struck well um, is brilliant, but it can be quite fragile, and I'm not surprised that people are zoning in on that. Do you think the flaws in Sitsipas' game, we're actually getting to the question now, thank you for send, taking the time to send this, do you think the flaws in his game are very deep and very technical, and the entire tour is slowly figuring him out, like his junior buddies, and if he can slide down fast in his ranking? Um, he's very lucky that Hashinov, Bautista, Rigut, Fanini, etc. all lost the first rounds, could have been easily out of the top ten, the top eight by the end of the US Open. Yeah, um, I think that's that's interesting. Um, because yeah, I I do think there are probably more issues on the backhand for Sitsipas. But you know, at the end of the day, Federer didn't always have the strongest backhand. And how did that develop? By Rafael Nadal pounding it again and again and again. This is probably how Sitsipas' backhand is going to improve by people repeatedly targeting it. And yeah, it's probably a weaker shot than his forehand and his net game. But you know, yeah, at the at the moment, the, the tour could be zoning in on that aspect. But I do think that as they do that, that will almost be 
the tool he needs to develop that shot and to become stronger. And, you know, Sitsipas has an amazing work ethic. He, it's obvious how much he lives for this, how much he wants this. And I, I don't think, I think he's quite smart on the court as well. I don't think it'll take him long to figure out that this is what's happening. And, you know, once that backhand is in a stronger place, he's got all the, the variety in his game. And, you know, for him to be in the top 10 right now and to have had some of the results he's had this year, really deeply impressive. So long term, I don't have worries about him. Uh, second question, considering the current draw on the ATP and how comfortable it's become for Rafael Nadal, do you expect the Spanish bull to run through or do you think Novak Djokovic will still be able to get there? Um, just reading the rest of the question. Okay, so I think that if Djokovic and Nadal both get to the final, Nadal could be in trouble because earlier in the season, we saw Nadal soar to the Australian Open final and Nadal steamroll to the Wimbledon semis. On both occasions, he then came up against a member of the big three, Djokovic initially, and then Federer at Wimbledon. And because he hadn't faced that kind of game style, I guess, so far in the tournament, he was more so, he was taken down. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of, I stumble over my words when I want to get to somewhere. Um, in the Australian Open, okay, uh, he even said this himself. When he got to Djokovic, Djokovic was forcing him to play a more conservative game style because he was getting on that ball early and he was pushing Nadal back. Now, all the way through the tournament, Nadal had played very intense, very aggressive. And when Djokovic forced him into another style of play, he went down quite quickly because he that wasn't his game plan. He wasn't used to it. Um, then the Federer match at Wimbledon, I didn't quite expect that one to play out in Federer's favour as much as it did, purely because Nadal had endured that intense second round match against Nick Kyrgios, who is an aggressive player, who has the firepower. But again, it had been a few rounds of fairly easily winnable matches um, for, for Nadal. And then when he came against Federer, you know, Federer was planting the returns so deep and really getting on top of Nadal. So my, yeah, I guess my worry for Nadal coming into a final with if he came up against Djokovic in the final, is will he be prepared for what Djokovic is bringing to the table? Because, yeah, he might have learned from Austra the Australian Open the fact that Djokovic isn't going to want to allow him to play the way he's been playing throughout the tournament. So, I mean, most of the time you would say, you know, Nadal's a really experienced player. He's faced these guys so many times, so that shouldn't be an issue. But, you know, it was at the Australian Open and it was at Wimbledon. So it's an interesting one to consider. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see Nadal lift the trophy at all, but I think that actually the fact that his half is more open, if either Djokovic or Federer gets to the final, that could backfire on him. So it's not necessarily a good thing. Um, where am I? I've lost my place again. Why does this happen? Okay, so I've answered those two questions. Uh, Nadal was good, a bit shaky, but good is the comment. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the intensity and stuff was all there from Nadal. I think it, in the early round, it's just kind of getting going. So um, I'm not worried that he was making more enforced errors than he probably likes. But oh, oh, Sangram beating Joe Wilfred Songa after Songa was up to love in sets was a bit of a shocker, but a super quality match. There were some awesome shots in that match. It's interesting, you know, because I did watch uh, uh, my next sister down as a huge, huge Songa fan. So we had that one on the TV. And um, how do I say this? The thing with Songa, okay, is I, I thought Songa was winning that match in four sets because I've watched so many of his matches over the years. And what he'll do is he'll be in a winning position. Being Songa, he'll throw in a few casual kind of cold shots, lose an unnecessary third set and win in four. And I thought that was going to happen because I don't think Sangren had the best start to that match from what I saw. It was quite erratic. And there was there were some great rallies in the match, but all in all, I, I didn't think it was a tremendous quality. Um, I think Songa, you know, that's that's a bad loss for Songa. Okay. The the injury thing is not really an excuse anymore because Songa has really struggled over the past year with injuries, but he's been back on tour for a little while now, for a good few weeks. He's played matches, he's gone up against big name players, he's tested himself out. 
and to be in a position like this where he was on the brink of a straight sets victory and losing five to a player that's not been in fantastic form recently, yes, yeah, Sangren is capable of quality, he comes to the net, etc. But no, that's uh, I wouldn't call it a shock because unfortunately it is Songa and I've seen him lose matches he should win before and he is streaky. Um, but it's uh, yeah, it's it's a big loss for Songa. I think that one will probably hit him hard because he should have won it. No question, he should have won it. And the draw was opening up for a player like Songa, who's been to a slam final before, who's beaten every name worth beating in the game. It was a clear opportunity. So big opportunity missed for Songa there, and it will be interesting to see how he reacts and rebounds from that match. Um, oh yeah. Team Nadal semis, it was the second best match of the year last year. Yeah, that, that I remember watching that US Open epic between Team and Nadal. A shame it had to end in a final set tie break, but that's what we're coming to. Um, yeah, but no, nothing that not happened into this year. I can't get my words out, I don't even know. Um, lack of sleep. Right, if Djokovic plays Vavrinka and Medvedev, one of those two will knock him out, I feel. Yeah, I think, you know, there are some dangers in that side of the draw, and I can only say what I've said before. If an upset is going to happen, it's going to be at this Grand Slam. Uh, the, the big three have been tremendously consistent at the majors this year. I mean, all three of them making the semis at the last two slams. It's what we used to see 24-7, but we haven't really seen that over the last couple of years, all three of them getting to that final four, two slams in a row. So, yeah, it's, it's been a great year for them. Um... What do you think about the Igor Sriantec Anastasia Sevastova match? Um, did I commentate on Sriantec this year? I lose track, you know, there's so, so many happen now, but I, I get the feeling that I did. I've watched her a little bit this year. Um, there's a lot of hype surrounding her. She's uh, She's got a game full of potential, but it is hit and miss at the moment. Sevastova, obviously very fluid, aesthetically pleasing player. And um, yeah, it's another one of those ones that could really go either way, I guess. I think Sevastova is seeded, right? I'm pretty sure. Um, she was seeded just outside the top 10 at a slam recently. Um, but I think, you know, Sevastova is one of those names that even when she's even when she's seeded quite high, it's not really a shock when she goes out because I don't really have her down as a slam contender. I think she beat Sharap over here previously. But yeah, okay, so she's the 12th seed. I thought that was it. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> okay. Thoughts on Simona Halep versus Nicole Gibbs? Uh, my first thought is I didn't watch it. It was over almost before I knew it was on, even though it was a three setter. Uh, so I, I honestly, I can't really pass comment on that match. Simona Halep, you know, she won Wimbledon in really impressive fashion, but players not named Serena Williams and Naomi Osaka don't really win back-to-back -back slams. So even though Halep's performed well here in the past, I'm not sure of her as an ultimate champion. Um, but, you know, even though it was in three sets, it's it's good to come through that first slam match when there's suddenly spotlight and pressure on you again. I don't think many people had Halep on the radar to win Wimbledon at the beginning of the tournament. So um, she's actually up there again now quite suddenly. Um, I think quite a few people almost wrote her off after she won that French Open trophy just for her kind of more relaxed approach to the majors. Uh, and now all eyes are on her again. So I, I think, you know, even though it was three sets, you know, good match for her to come through. And as the rounds go on, we'll kind of be able to analyze more of technically how she's doing and what she's doing. Um, okay. <laughs> That's not a... Uh, uh, fun fact, Roger Federer won Roland Garros more recently than the US Open. Um, interesting fact and not one that I'd honestly properly realized. So much for your Sharapova win prediction. When did I pre predict Sharapova to win? Never in my life against Serena Williams because she was I was seven last time she beat her. So, um, yeah, no, uh, okay, I know. In my last video, when I was talking about the fact that Serena opens against Sharapova, I gave a couple, two or three things that were potentially in Sharapova's favor because I was trying to be balanced and weigh up what was good for both. 
honestly, I didn't think Sharapova was going to win. Who thought Sharapova was going to win, really? Um, she went out there. She didn't do anything different to what she's done against Serena the past 10 times they've played. Tried to hit through her from the baseline. Wasn't working. Serena, you know, once Serena had got through that first couple of days, days? Once she didn't even last, like, a percentage of a day. Once Serena had gone through those first couple of games, kind of shook off the rust, got the nerves out of her system, there was only one winner in that match because Serena said herself before, she said something really casual like, oh, I feel like Sharapova's a really good matchup for me. You don't say, you do not say, you you eat up her shots. Literally, she, she absorbs, she redirects, she passes. I mean, Sharapova at one point late in that match decided to try and come to the net, just finally decided to try something different, but she's not a net player, she never has been. So she had no answers, and the more this continues, I mean, that's 19 straight wins for Serena, the more I think she will never have answers against Serena Williams, and with her results at the moment, it's questionable whether she'll have answers against anyone else, because, you know, I, to, okay, to an extent, I understand why this match was hyped. There's been beef between these two players, and a long, long time ago, when I was pretty much still a baby, Sharapova beat Serena Williams in a major final, but... It's the past now, you know, Sharapova is struggling to beat players at the edge of the top 100, let alone Serena Williams, so it's um it's an interesting time for Sharapova. I, one of the things I said in my last video that was that her only really big win since the drug span against Simona Halep came in the US Open first round, and that's nearly two years ago now, so I understand that Sharapova's been injured, but even before that drug span, and I've said this before, I felt she was overrated. She, um, the game was almost kind of leaving her behind. There was more variety coming through, and Sharapova's a big baseline here, so she doesn't really do much else, doesn't land a serve as much as she should. So it's trouble, it's troubling times for Sharapova, and she's gritty, you know, she's committed. I don't see her giving up, but yeah, it, it's it's tough times for her at the moment, and I'm not going to write her off because if you know if things open up, if things crumble in a women's major as they sometimes do, there's going to be opportunities for her. But I don't think it's on her racket anymore. It's on the rackets of many other women who I think are better than her. Um, a coaching warnings becoming an issue at the U.S. Open. I don't know. I mean. If you get coached, you get a warning, right? Even if you don't see it, it's um, at the end of the day. I mean, like I said, I understood to an extent why Serena was upset at the US Open last year because she claimed not to have seen the coaching efforts of Patrick Maratoglou. But, you know, at the end of the day, your coach is a part of your team. To an extent, they're your responsibility. So if you don't want them to coach you, tell them prior to the match. And if they're seen attempting to coach you, you're going to get a warning. That's the sport. That's the rules. So there you go. Um, I'm going to wrap up very shortly because play for the day starts very soon. Which possible third round match would you be most interested in? Serena Williams versus Sue Shea or Naomi Osaka versus Coco Goff? Um, hmm. I mean, everyone will know how annoyed I got over the Coco Goff hype during Wimbledon. It, and it's a, it's a shame to me because, you know, she's been on my radar and many other people's radars for some time. I, some time. I was impressed with her, with the network she had around her, with the, the game she had at a young age and the focus she had at a young age. But, you know, I, I guess that would, if Goff does make the third round, because it's not a guarantee, and if Osaka makes the third round, because that's not a guarantee either, particularly after her first round match, which reminded me of the Anna Karolina Schmiedlova match she came through at the French Open that I thought would get her going, but was really the start of her decline there. Um, yeah, it's a case of if Osaka and Goff do actually make the third round, and if they did, actually, yeah, that could be quite an interesting match just because of the dynamics of it. Osaka, still young, but defending champion. Goff trying to come through, being crowd favourite. Um, but then Serena versus Shea, I mean, Serena can do everything, right? She's got the power, but she can mix it up too. But Shea is the kind of player that could frustrate her because she'll move her around. She strips the pace from the ball. I mean, Serena will probably know that and be ready for it like she was against Barbara Stritzova in the Wimbledon semis. But, you know, honestly, both of those matchups have the potential to be really intriguing and uh, quite good battles. Although I think Serena would probably have less trouble with Shea than Osaka would with 
goth, just given the dynamic the dynamics of both matches. Gonna wrap up soon before I do any more bad grammar or anything. Do you think Yoshihito Nishioka can go far in the tournament? He got that win over Nishikori recently, didn't he? That was good for him. I haven't actually... I don't recall where he is in the draw, so... That could have something to do with it. We haven't really looked into the draw, have we, this time? But I'll leave that to next time because we have been here like nearly an hour and I, I did plan on keeping this one more like half an hour. But thank you for showing up. I did notice quite a few people were watching at one point, so maybe this is a decent time. Let me know if this is a decent time for you. I'm sorry I can't suit it to everyone, but actually there are a lot more viewers at this time of day than I expected. Um, where is Nishioka? Um... Or do you mean... Yeah, okay, so he's playing Feliciano Lopez next. And then he faces the winner of Hugo Delian and Daniel Medvedev. He's actually in a more open part of the draw, considering that he's in the Djokovic, versus Djokovic and Federer half. So, yeah, I, I think that there are opportunities for him. He's a talented player, probably overshadowed by the likes of Nishikori and that. But, you know, you know he's got potential. Um, okay wrapping up. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, we will be back again to do this after the second round. Thank you for your questions. Some really interesting ones there, actually. Keep it up for next time. And um, yeah, good discussion. And yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if the seeds can keep holding it together. I know we've seen one or two unexpected seeds go out, but all in all, you know, the, the big, big names are still there. So it will be interesting to see how they do. And I will be back next time, end of the second round, to answer your questions again. So thank you for tuning in and I will see you next time.